Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome to Shelf Stories, the channel that tells tales from games, books, and life. I am your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for stopping by for this latest episode of Good Trouble, the series where I engage in above-the-table conversations that I fear are necessary in the board gaming space in a spirit of education and compassion. This is part 2A, <laughs> I'll explain that in a second, uh, of my series that is culminating a full year, 2021, of episodes of Good Trouble, uh, where I engage in all sorts of conversations, game analysis, uh, different things that come up in the community, uh, all those third rail topics that a lot of people don't want to touch, but I feel because this community is important to me, because games are important to me, and because you, everybody that's watching this, are important to me, I think uh, I have tried to lay some track and open up conversations where they could be a little bit difficult. That is what Good Trouble is all about, and that is what this series in particular uh, is about here. I'll say more about that in a second, but I wanted to just say again, thank you for being with me throughout the year. I gave a big thank you at the previous video, uh, so I'm not going to repeat myself, but I will say this is Shelf Stories. This is Good Trouble. I also have Shelf Help, which is my mental health series. I have history chats, book chats. If you're new to Shelf Stories, welcome. There is a part one to this video. This is part 2A. There will be a part 2B and then a part 3. So like the video, subscribe to the channel, share it out if you like what I'm doing here on Shelf Stories. All right, so let's jump right in. As I just said, Good Trouble represents my desire to facilitate better, deeper, more constructive, more forward-looking conversations about all these difficult topics that come up in gaming. Uh, I am certainly not a uh, scriber to the philosophy of no politics. Uh, I Quite the opposite. <laughs> uh, from my perspective, uh, coming from a marginalized uh, community uh, with, with my life experiences and with friends and loved ones who are also from their own, uh, have their own perspectives. They're all there. We don't have to try. We just see them. Uh, and we would like to surface those issues and present them to the community and talk about them, but it doesn't always go well. So that's what this particular series of episodes is all about, the real talk about racism. Uh, and I could have picked any of the isms, but racism has to be the one I know the best. Uh, this is my attempt to really distill what I think are some through lines that have come up all year. You know, you watch the videos, certain things come up in every single video, and I'm putting them together here uh, in this year-end summary. And uh, to do so, I want to create, uh, as much as I can, kind of an intimate conversation with uh, what I'm calling the nice, moderate, white guy. In terms of bridging the gap, that's who I speak with most. Uh, because that's the center of the hobby demographically. It's the center of the hobby in terms of, you know, uh, the people running the shows and, you know, making the games and designing the games, all that kind of stuff. Just look at the data. I presented them in the last video. Uh, and as I begin this conversation, I think every uh, conversation that's worth it uh, should begin this way. I want to set the context of kindness and non-judgment. Uh, I wanted to uh, identify what I'm hearing from folks, show folks that I'm trying to listen to the best that I can to internalize feedback. Uh, and they're telling me, this is what I feel when we, whenever someone like me mentions the word racism, feel judged. Uh, they feel like they can't say what they got to say without the ism hammer coming out. They feel like they can't play what they want to play. Uh, they feel like they were talking about the color of their skin, something they can't change. And as I went through that is not my intention at all. Uh, you know, play what you want to play, say what you want to say, uh, and let's talk as people. You know, and I value the perspective you bring as a person, even if I have uh, other difficulties. If the last video was about kindness, then this one's not going to be as comfortable. I'm going to have some stronger medicine to offer moving forward. Matter of fact, over the next two videos, uh, 2A and 2B, I'm going to share two uncomfortable truths that arise in these racism conversations. Uh, I'm going to split them so that each truth has its own form for our discussion. The first uncomfortable truth is that when I talk to folks, nice, moderate white folks, uh, about this racism stuff, I tend to encounter a definition that is, at best, limited and truncated. Simply put, we're not having the same conversation. We're not talking about the same thing. Uh, it, you know, there's a part that is perfectly correct, but there are pieces missing. And it is in those missing pieces that we get a lot of the disagreement, the division, and the fraughtness. In the 
prism of a nice, moderate understanding of racism. It is uh, personal, emotional, intentional. Racism is a thing that people do to people. And I'll quote Wikipedia here. Uh, I, I, I don't normally do that move. Oh, let me go ahead and quote the dictionary. But I think a lot of the misunderstanding uh, comes from a definition like this. Quote, racism is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against other people because they're of a different race or ethnicity. Think of those words, right? Prejudice and uh, discrimination. These are antagonism. Uh, these are words that indicate emotion. They indicate people doing a thing and feeling hatred. At the end of the day, that racism is understood as hatred. And that that's a thing that is, you know, kind of one-to-one. -one, that I hate somebody on the basis of the color of their skin or something else about them that they can't change. In that framework, then it's very hard to talk about racism outside of the racist. It's a version of racism that focuses on the perpetrator of racism. So then uh, it's almost like racism can't exist without it being generated by a person. So, you know, I'm, here's a board game. It's like, oh, this is some problematic stuff. There's some racist elements over here. Uh, then in that understanding, the move is to defend the creator of the game, to say, well, they didn't mean it. Again, understanding racism as an intentional thing. And here's where the conversation really takes a left turn. That when I or someone else says that a, a thing, a concept, a board game, whatever, is racist, that the person feels like we're they're being called racist for liking the thing. Oh, this game Puerto Rico is racist. Am I a racist because I like to play it? Seven things had to happen that were almost always unsaid in terms of the interpretation that lands on the person is feeling like they're being called a racist. And I was talking with a friend of mine, uh, William uh, Brown, the Hungry Gamer. Go ahead and check out his YouTube channel. Um, he called it the white nightmare. The white bear. The idea, the even faintest whiff that someone is calling them a racist and trying to make that label stick. And it is the thing that uh, so many people are afraid of. It is the thing that derails so many of these conversations. When a nice, moderate white person feels like someone is calling them racist. Why is that so bad? I've spoken about it many, many times on previous Good Trouble episodes, but it bears repeating. Uh, this It's this implication that they are KKK. They are Klansmen. They're white supremacists. You know, they're playing Puerto Rico, but they have like white hoods uh, in the uh, closet over there and they d believe in white supremacy and terrible things and hatred. Again, hate, hate, hate. That is the framework that we are understanding uh, so many of these conversations. So to be clear, I refer to the understanding of racism as reductive to emotions and intentions. Uh, I'm calling it a misunderstanding. It's not wrong. I just feel like there's a bunch of pieces missing. Uh, and I'll fill in those missing pieces in just a second. I do need to acknowledge, though, uh, to give credit to the side. So I'm not just saying that you're, you know, hired a misunderstanding. Uh, I will say that we on the progressive side don't always help. That we put it out there. And that becomes very loud voices that racism is, you know, we're, we're talking about racists over here. We're centering the, the perpetrator. Uh, we do that too. And I would like to try to clear that up. So for, to my mind, one of the biggest offenders, the most famous offenders and a big target for pushback are diversity trainings in, works, in workplaces. And they happen all over the place. Like they happen in McDonald's and Starbucks and uh, all the way up the, you know, the corporate ladder and workplaces, all that kind of thing. Uh, where which tend to focus on the emotional, which tend to say, well, here's um, you know, here's your implicit bias, and here is your white privilege, and you need to sit in the guilt of all that privilege. And I, I see where it's coming from, but that stuff does not help. That is not stuff that I advocate or support at all. I want to be clear. And even folks who know better. Even folks who, who have learned from over, you know, uh, many, many years of, of reading and studying about this stuff and talking about this stuff. Uh, you know, we hit a point of frustration when we're, you know, trying to do our work and trying to have conversations and then just constant pushback and losses and losing ground keeps happening anyway. So, you know, some of us break and we think, oh, well, they, they just, you know, I must be dealing with a bunch of racists. Uh, <laughs> 
So to illustrate the point, I'm going to quote uh, from a Hugo Award winning uh, science fiction writer named N.K. Jemison, who is responding to a local election where an anti-critical race theory uh, candidate won on the backs of, amongst other people, moderate white folks. Great, but anti-CRT people aren't actually upset about CRT. What they want is no black educators, no black books, hell, no black kids, no honesty about the Holocaust or indigenous genocide. What they really are is pro-white supremacy, period, full stop, and we need to say that. <sighs> In the face of that, of course, the these conversations are going to be uh, very likely funneled through that, well, this is what they really want, this is what they really mean type filter. Uh, another example in terms of uh, drilling down the emotion, I'll uh, uh, quote ha uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, the writer of the 1619 Project. Uh, quote, it's actually simple. If you can feel pride in things you didn't t personally take part in, then you can feel shame in things you didn't personally take part in. Again, emotions, shame. It's a part of the conversation. And I do acknowledge that, you know, moderate white folk, you're seeing a discourse on our side and you're seeing enough of this understanding of racism as emotional and, uh, you know, person-centered. But what I would like to offer you is the missing piece to help you understand fully where we're coming from. And so I would like to shift the focus uh, away from this reductive idea of racism as uh, intentional, oh, did they mean it, did they not mean it, or, you know, emotion or hatred-driven, oh, does he hate them or does she hate this or their third thing? <sighs> Uh, first of all, I mean, as true as those things can possibly be, conversations on that level, especially in our community, are, I find, just very, very unproductive. They reduce to people feeling attacked and people, you know, questioning each other's good faith and ad hominem. And, you know, if we're going to talk about racism that way, then it will always turn into a car crash. I don't want that. And the second thing is, I truly feel that focusing on intention so much is like focusing on the tip of an iceberg, and there's a whole big old chunk of ice right down there that we have to talk about. And from a marginalized person's perspective, from my, you know, uh, from my cultural background, I see a lot more of the iceberg, and there's a lot of people who feel the same way, and maybe others don't because of your perspective. As I like to do here on Shelf Stories, uh, in order to attain that uh, shift in perspective, change your mind, you can change the world. I would like to turn from focusing on the person to focusing on practice. Would like to shift focus away from the perpetrator and onto the victim. Uh, away from the intention or the possible intention of the perpetrator to the material and social impacts on the victims. You will often hear that racism is systemic. And it's like that. So that's a, you know, a little bit of a helpful uh, shift, but it, it, I don't think it goes far enough just in and of itself. Racism is systemic. What is the system? What, you know, who's operating the system? What is it outputting? All that kind of stuff. I don't understand what you mean. Okay, so let's break it down. Really what systemic racism means. For me, my working definition is that racism is the systemic theft and denial of wealth and opportunity that benefits the dominant culture and takes wealth away from marginalized cultures. Wealth, stuff. This kind of racism does not need an intentional doer. You know, obviously there are people along the way that start the things and there are people, uh, you know, kind of down the chain that keep the thing going. But when we talk about systemic racism, we're talking about cultural ideas and those you know pervade you know you can switch people in and out of the culture but the cultural idea will still remain policies actual laws you know it could change the judges and change the who enforces the law but if the law is there and the law is structured in such a way to take wealth and deny opportunity to build that wealth then that's what we're talking about really what we're talking about we're talking about racism and so why am I focused on this? Uh, why am I taking such pains to reframe the conversation about racism away from attention and hatred and towards this material understanding? Because board games are a consumerist hobby. The title of the video is not follow the emotions, it is follow the money. 
It takes money to be a part of this hobby in a serious way. I am blessed. You see the games that I have on my shelf here. And if I showed you the top shelf and the bottom shelf, I got more uh, along the way, you would know that I've spent thousands of dollars over the last few years building my collection. I'm very blessed to do that. And I want to be able to talk about that without, um, you know, triggering all this guilt and shame, not trying to guilt and shame anybody. If you have a collection, more power to you. That's great. It takes money to design games. Uh, it takes money to, you know, have the uh, free time, uh, get some vacation work from your job, actually be able to take vacation from your job, uh, you know, go to conventions and make connections and sell your design or something like that. Uh, it's not impossible if you do it, you know, from a lower class perspective, but it's very much easier. The road is so much more open. The opportunity is so much more open. If you have a little bit of money, we're talking like middle class and up. And, you know, that goes without saying, you need some capital in order to found a company and, you know, you know, make and distribute and publish people's games. We never, ever talk about this in a serious way in the hobby that, you know, it takes, uh, you know, financial capacity to be in this hobby and through, you know, you board games are way downstream of the society, you know, society is having an inequality problem and that inequality problem falls along race lines and color lines and ethnic lines. The center of power in society and, you know, like a, almost like a, a, a photocopy, you know, 10 of photocopies down, uh, you know, has a white center, white moderate center, as, as a matter of fact. I'm being very careful here, people. I'm, Physically not using the word white supremacist, you know, because that phrase is baked in with all sorts of like hatred feelings and, you know, dominance. That's a useless phrase to me in this context. So I'm kind of using a, 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 a mixed mastered phrase, white centrality, right? I want to be able to talk about that. I want to be able to talk about how when we say that the center of the hobby is white and here we these marginalized folks, women, POC, LGBTQ, who want representation, well, we can't just get that because it takes wealth and opportunity to make those creations. You hear that all the time. Well, if you don't like how the hobby looks, then make, go make your own games. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> With what wealth and opportunity, you know, that you have to ask questions about the larger society and how it's structured, you know? And, you know, this is also, um, this is, you know, worldwide. And, you know, obviously I have a lot of listeners in Europe who are, you know, kind of looking at this. Uh, you know, I apologize. I only, I know best the American context. So I'm going to talk about American history in this context. And that becomes a difficult thing because that can also trigger the feelings and the emotions. And so I'm going to say very concretely and very directly, I don't care about your feelings. I love you. I'm going through all these pains to reach out and talk to you, but I don't care about your feelings, especially your guilt. I talk about the situation that how we got here, you know, how the, the center of the hobby got, you know, the wealth and opportunities. Now the marginalized folks uh, not only don't have as much, but the, uh, the, the idea is that there are systems in place that create those conditions that deny wealth and that steal wealth. You know, and, and make it and make the pipeline flow from one group to the other or a bunch of groups towards the center. That's not to trigger any guilt feelings. It's just trying to take those feelings out and uh, look at it from just a cold analytical perspective. So the first thing that I, could, I would ask any moderate white folks that are watching is to try to diminish as much as you can that emotional reaction and ride with me. So... Y'all know me. Y'all know I like my history. Uh, I would like to take a brief little jaunt through uh, relevant points in American history, uh, looking at racism, not necessarily through this emotional lens, but uh, through that material lens that I'm, I keep on mentioning. And the reason I want to do this is because there is so much uh, happening with our school system. There is such resistance on the part of nice, moderate white folks that are super triggered at this point because they think that by uh, paying more attention, by teaching the 1619 Project and all that other stuff, uh, that we are teaching our kids to hate themselves, that to feel guilty, to hate their skin and to hate their ancestors. And America is a, you know, uh, inevitably racist country. All this ugh, stuff. 
if we focus on the parts that provoke emotion, then I can see where people are coming from. If a teacher is teaching about the brutality of slavery alone, if they're teaching about the violence and, you know, the, the whippings and uh, the all the difficult stuff, you know, like a 12 years a slave or roots or, you know, you, you get the image of the back that is all lashed up and everything. If that's going to be the way we teach slavery, then of course, that's where we're going to end up as pokes who thinks that we're teaching this stuff just to make white people feel bad. It's not the point. It's not what projects like the 1619 Project and others are trying to do. Trying to highlight, yes, the emotional stuff, but also the structure that stole and denied wealth and opportunity to a whole group of people over hundreds of years. We don't think of slavery as acts of systemic theft, do we? But think about it. Think about, you know, a lot of my of the people that watch the show uh, are workers or were workers at one time. Maybe you're retired. God bless you if you are. Imagine a situation where you work a whole day's work and you have nothing, nothing to show for it. Days, weeks, months, years. You work, 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 and you generate no wealth whatsoever. For you, your family, you can save nothing. It is all extracted. That is closer to the mindset that we want to uh, get people to think about when it comes to thinking about slavery. Why? Because it explains wealth inequality. It explains why a group of people has had so much trouble building wealth, which is power here in America and all over the world. Wealth to have power. Well, for the longest time, they lived in a condition where they could not build wealth. The society appropriated it, built in systems to leech that wealth the entire time. Slavery was abolished in 1865. Voting rights, as you know, we've had multiple chances at voting rights in different um, areas. And fortunately, the legacy of slavery and some of the things that have happened have put structures in place to make wealth creation that much more difficult. So let me step back. Let me uh, continue to uh, articulate ways in which our emotional lenses obscure some of the material realities that are way more important for us to know. Uh, so we have the plight of black folks who came to America at the beginnings. We also have the indigenous folks who were displaced systematically, speaking of systems, by the Western governments, United States, Canada, all over the place. And the tendency is to read that through the lens of genocide. You hear a lot about that. We just celebrated uh, Thanksgiving and, you know, the Native uh, People's Day, Day of Mourning. Uh, mourning, you know, another emotion, uh, thinking about all the terrible things that we did to the uh, Indians. Uh, and and this was a couple of weeks before this. Uh, there was a headline that came out of Canada about the, um, na the boarding schools uh, that were in charge of uh, taking Native children away from their families and re-educating them in white language, uh, white religion, white culture. And, you know, we saw those bodies and our first instinct was emotional, again, emotional. And through this new lens, it's, I think it's probably proper to bring in the context of, it wasn't just like a brutal thing it was. It was also a way to tear families apart, tear the culture apart so they couldn't resist land grabs. And it was an attempt to educate the children in the mindset of property. For a Native American context, it doesn't make sense to own land. How do you own land? Land belongs to everybody. So in order for the Western society to be able to parcel up land and do private property, all that kind of stuff, you know, they had to rip apart uh, <laughs> na uh, natives, uh, bring the children in and educate those children into that mindset of property. So rather than focusing on the genocide, we're going to focus here on the land grabs. And what is land? Land is wealth. So I'm going to keep on going. I could do this all day. <laughs> it wasn't just the big land masses that appropriated wealth from entire peoples. It was uh, down to into uh, Latin American countries. 
Uh, so, you know, the United States achieved its uh, independence in the 1790s. Uh, very shortly afterwards, in 1804, very present on the founders' minds was the independence of Haiti. Haiti, a country on the island of Hispaniola, a very tiny island, but very rich. Uh, so, you know, had history gone a certain way, they could have developed on their own. However, because it was a slave society, and we're talking about a very racist in the hatred and the appropriative sense, uh, you know, world back in the day, that could not stand. So very shortly uh, afterwards, in 1825, the French king, Charles uh, X, sent an armed flotilla of warships to Haiti with the message that the young nation would have to pay France 150 million francs in today's money, billions of dollars, to secure its independence or suffer the consequences. This sum was 10 times the amount the United States had paid France in the Louisiana Purchase, which had doubled the size of the U.S. Haiti caved to France's demands in order to secure its independence. It had to. It's a little, tiny country. It, it, it won the independence by its skin of its teeth. So, uh, you know, with France and all of its wealth and opportunity and gunships, uh, they, they had to cave. It was too much for the young nation to pay outright, so it took out loans with a hefty interest to pay back a French bank, paying back French slaveholders and their descendants the equivalent of between 20 and $30 billion in today's dollars. That is racism understood in the emotional sense, but it is also literally theft upon theft upon theft, which took Haiti 100 some odd years to pay back. And it didn't stop with Haiti, and it didn't stop with the French. The United States in particular has had its hand in the cookie jar of so many Latin American countries. If it's not the United States, go ahead and Google the United Fruit Company and figure out if what they're doing is as racist or more than any individual white supremacist can pull off. Am I going through all this history to make you feel bad? I hope that at this point you realize that it's not about that. I don't, I, I, again, I don't care if this triggers guilt or if it triggers anger or denial or any of these feelings. Take that out and just focus on the facts that explain how we got to this world. Why don't we have black, indigenous, Latino, Caribbean, uh, you know, and then we could go on, you know, with women and LGBTQ and all the history there. Why are those folks in the margins and these folks in the center? There's a history there. All right, more history. <laughs> this stuff is totally my jam and it's my channel. I'll talk about it all I want. <laughs> but for the sake of the viewership, I will try to continue to focus on the relevant historical bits that uh, help me tell this material story. At the end of the day, we'll talk about racism. Uh, we'll talk about why the community looks like the way it does and why we're having such hard conversations. I'm telling you that there's material reasons. I'm trying to lay all that out. Hopefully, uh, you're still tracking with me. Okay, so let's get out of the far past and go to the more recent past. Less than 100 years ago, the American century, 20th century, 1930s, Great Depression's happening, but, uh, you know, government is responding. New deal, and let's try to invest in the country. Uh, and, you know, then we get World War II and uh, post-war, 50s. In a real way, America is built, modern America, the infrastructure of it, is built in the 50s and beyond. Suburbs exploded. Uh, this That becomes the uh, kind of main way for middle class folks and up. Uh, you know, uh, have their wealth is in their homes and in their the neighborhoods and their suburbs. Uh, highways, railroads, all this stuff was built up. And because America doesn't really build anything anymore, we are kind of on that legacy of what was built at that time period. So it is valid to ask, was that time period racist? Did it have racism in that first way of, you know, uh, the bigots and the you know white supremacists and all that kind of thing? Uh, you know, and were they, were they in charge? And did it have policies uh, that built in theft and denial of wealth on just a systemic level? You bet your buns, it had both. Up and down, 1950s America was extremely and utterly racist in every sense of the word. But I'm going to focus on the structures. You know, a lot of times when we go over this history, we're like in your history class, we talk about the actual racist. Uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson, a total white supremacist in the White House, white 1910s. Uh, you know, up and down the Dixiecrats, in the, you know, in the South who were in charge of all the state houses and the, and the Senate. Uh, they, 
you know, these are the people that were actual racists. They did a lot of things to, you know, slow down civil rights and instantiate Jim Crow, all that kind of stuff. But focusing on them, again, lets us off the hook of considering the material stuff and how it continues to impact our modern world and our modern gaming uh, scenario. Okay. So housing. I live in a house. And where do we game? We game in houses. Who owns the houses? Who was able to build wealth with their homes as the, the society was being built up? White folks. So many places were obviously uh, pitched towards white folks only. You had immigrants coming in, but the successful immigrants were fair-skinned who were able to you know, uh, learn the culture, learn the language, get rid of their accents, and assimilate into the larger culture, melting pot styles. Part of the, of the gene of America is to assimilate. And so, you know, so you had the Italians and the Americans and more Eastern Europeans were able to kind of uh, blend in. Who couldn't? Who was inassimilable? Black and brown, a lot of brown uh, communities too, especially black black communities. Besides the exclusionary leasing, you had this practice called redlining, where uh, whether the, the whether the lender was the, the government itself or private lenders, they would uh, agree to not lend into these neighborhoods. They agreed to not invest in these neighborhoods where black folks were. So as the community was building up wealth, you know, the, uh, a lot of minority groups were left totally behind. You know, I'm blessed. This is my home. This is a starter home. I was able to get a loan way, you know, uh, <laughs> along the way only a couple of years ago. There are folks in the hobby who are benefiting from generations and generations and generations of wealth. Once again, I can't stop saying this is not about, you know, triggering guilt or anything. It is, uh, this is just a space to be able to try to talk about you know, th this, the reality of where wealth come from, you know, wealth, you know, we think of wealth as this thing that we earn, but really most of wealth is inherited. <laughs> most of wealth, you know, over 60% of wealth that uh, accounted for the United States has been handed down, inherited from land and home. So that's how um, they were denied, uh, the, those communities were denied wealth. Then wealth was actually stolen and broken in the way that we built our highways and factories and dumps and all that other stuff. So you had communities that, you know, were thriving or were struggling or were in some kind of a uh, process. But then during that time, depending on where you were uh, and depending on who had influence and, you know, who mapped out the road, it would punch through so many neighborhoods. It broke so many neighborhoods. Uh, they called it urban renewal, but... And I'm going to let somebody else describe this because they can describe it way better than I can. A boy last week, he was 16 in San Francisco, told me on television. Thank God we got him to talk. Maybe somebody will start to listen. He said, I got no country, I've got no flag. Now he's only 16 years old. And I couldn't say you do. I don't have any evidence to prove that he does. They were tearing down his house. Because San Francisco is engaging, as all, most northern cities now are engaged, in something called urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. Getting, it means Negro removal. That is what it means. And the federal government is, a, is, is, is an accomplice to this fact. Now this, we're talking about human beings. There's not such a thing as a monolithic wall or you know, some abstraction called the Negro problem. These Negro boys and girls who at 16 and 17 don't believe the country means anything that it says, don't feel they have any place here on the basis of the performance of the entire country. That was the amazing American playwright, poet, a novelist, James Baldwin. Uh, one of the gems that we've ever produced. It is totally worth your time just watching some of his videos. Urban renewal is Negro removal. Lines exactly up with the definition that I'm working with, the... Uh, theft and denial of wealth and resources to a group of people, a, a racial category, ethnic category. That is what I'm calling racism. And if you're, you're curious, you can Google urban renewal in general or Google the Claiborne Highway, New Orleans in particular. Uh, that one encapsulates so much of what's going on. This is all kind of pointing towards more uh, knowledge and research. But at this point, you might be saying, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I've had enough, uh, plus all this history stuff, uh, you know, having things gotten better, 
You know, we passed voting rights, we passed all these great laws, and, you know, now I see more successful people than ever uh, walking around intermarriage, which is something that a racist would never, ever tolerate, but, you know, those rates are spiking through the roof, and, you know, as a society, we're healthier, and aren't we getting better? Aren't things getting better? Which is something that the nice moderate white guy says about games. Leave it alone. It'll it'll it's bad. It's good, and it'll get better on its own, right? I would like to bring in another philosopher of our time here in America. You feel, <laughs> you feel however, that uh, that we're making progress in in this country no, and worldwide. No, no, no. I, I will never say that progress is being made. If you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. Mm -hmm. You pull it all the way out, that's not progress. The progress is healing the wound that the blow, that the blow made. And they haven't even begun to pull a knife out, much less try and pull, uh, heal the wound. You have, have, you have they won't even admit the knife is there. <laughs> you have any? So that was Malcolm X. Uh, speaking of people for whom it is worth your time to catch up in their thought, I don't know that America has produced many more brilliant minds than that one. If there is no healing, there is no progress. Talk about racism as a systemic theft of denial of wealth and resources. If you, there is no effort to redress those wounds, then what are we really talking about? If wealth compounds upon wealth, compounds about wealth and creates a, a kind of power center uh, that can be a little bit insulated, then uh, marginalized folks are starting from, you know, way back in terms of, you know, trying to build the wealth and capacity on our own to be able to move ourselves into, you know, the center of the hobby or, you know, the center of power structures in society. So now I can talk about the current. Uh, we're, not, we're out of history anymore. And we're, now we're talking about the current scene and have things gotten better in so many important ways, not really. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple categories now. Uh, so let's talk about wealth. Uh, as of 2020, the average black family had one tenth of the wealth of the average white family across, you know, uh, the United States. That proportion has uh, continued. That was the proportion in the 1950s, and it is the proportion today. So overall, wealth has gone up, you know, rising tide and all that kind of thing. But the disparity remains. And with that, the power differential remains. There are actually some places in America where the average black uh, family wealth is negative because of debt. You know, you have white families that at least have their home. And, you know, that counts their wealth. You know, maybe their average is like 100 some odd thousand. I'm thinking of, if I'm not mistaken, a place like Boston or other urban centers. Uh, and then an average black family, the wealth would be negative or like $10. Uh, literally, uh, something along those lines. Attached to that is a practice that I'll talk you off about this one too. Um, it is called not in my backyard or NIMBY for short. I might have some folks who engage in NIMBY in their community of um, projects as people, you know, I, I love you. Let's talk and everything. But the practice, I don't know that there's a more racially impactful practice than NIMBY. Why? Because when the society was built, it was built wise exclusionary in, a, in too many areas. And NIMBY is the practice of fighting new development. You know, you want a school, you want a new house, you want affordable housing, you want an apartment complex, not here in my neighborhood, not in my backyard. And there are lots of people who spend a lot of money and a lot of time fighting this stuff. So what's the result? We have a uh, country where we're about 7 million homes short of being able to house everybody. You know, why do we have such a homeless problem? There are no homes. Too many municipalities are fighting to, you know, keep their home, keep their community together because they like it, you know. Uh, and I don't want to take that away from folks. I don't want to, oh, you're a NIMBY, therefore you're a racist. People I'm talking to, but the practice I really want to identify, uh, really want to analyze and see what are the downstream effects and how it racially impactful they are. It doesn't get worse, in my opinion, because of the way we build wealth in America through our homes, it doesn't get worse than NIMBY. So many other systemic aspects, education, 
in America. We fund our local schools with property taxes, neighborhood by neighborhood. So at, yeah, telling the wealth story through homes, uh, it is the richer homes that can afford to pay the taxes that will pay for the richer, more resourced schools. And you have this giant disparity across, you know, you might even have a uh, really oblong performing schools right next to each other because one neighborhood is next to another and one neighborhood has so much more than the other. And we tear our hair and wonder why our outcomes are so low. And meanwhile, we tolerate the system of massively unequal funding of schools. And who benefits? The people with the property. I don't have to tell that whole story again. In healthcare, uh, so, you know, just, we're talking about like life over here. Uh, so, you know, before the pandemic, and I can't believe I'm still talking about the pandemic, but here we are uh, two and a half years later, screw you, COVID <laughs> in 2021. Even before then, we struggled with the disparity. You know, blacks and Latinos and, you know, other community, uh, marginalized communities had lower rates of health, uh, you know, lived in poorer neighborhoods, uh, lived next to the, the dumps and the highways that I talked about earlier in the segment. So lacking uh, in health, just generally unhealthier people, asthma and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, a higher infant mortality, higher maternal mortality, all on down the line, all this stuff, higher, uh, higher rates of poor outcomes for um, minority communities. Then COVID hit. Blacks and Latinos died at higher rates across the board. Mostly because, again, uh, higher comorbidities because of the way we live and the, uh, the, uh, the physical environment, partly because of lack of health insurance and partly because we tend to work the essential jobs, right? Uh, our jobs are essential. We're the frontline workers. We're the healthcare workers and all, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we were less able to kind of be work remote and more exposed. And so we died at higher rates. Seriously, folks, I keep going. Police, criminal justice, media... There are so many other connections. Uh, and as a social worker, I'm kind of trained to see that stuff. But I think that is uh, sufficient for now. So uh, let me return to the main point. And I know, 40-minute videos. Uh, this is, in a lot of ways, my audiovisual journal that I'm inviting people into. So uh, in a way, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> but thank you if you've come along for the ride. Point being, real truth about racism. And any ism, sexism and you know, homophobia, it's there is is that personal dimension, but there is that more undertold, but probably more important dimension of material uh, deprivation and denial of wealth and resources. So why is that important in board gaming? It's important in board gaming. Uh, I'll return to that point that I said in the uh, towards the middle of the episode. We are a consumerist hobby. This has to happen. Uh, you know, uh, this wall and the collections and, the, you know, having at least a middle class, uh, you know, a situation in life to be able to really participate in hobby gaming uh, in various ways, whether it's a collector or a maker or whatever it is. And it is very, very much worth understanding, uh, you know, how class and race and all that stuff plays out because we are downstream of all that stuff. Uh, and why we're having so many issues like, you know, just why don't we have more representation because of class dynamics and how class and race intersect. And we should be able to find a space to talk about that stuff without, you know, getting all the heat and getting all the feelings. That's number one. Number two, uh, specific to kind of the way we talk about this stuff online. I really think that uh, the interpretation of racism as that, you know, personal and emotional thing is doing a lot of damage to our discourse because it robs us of attention. It it's, it's almost like, you know, uh, there's oxygen in the room, but then you light a big fire and it sucks all the oxygen out and there's none left for what we're really talking about. You know, uh, we're talking about intent and impact. We're talking about the perpetrator and the victim. You know, we're talking about uh, you know not having enough and all these material things, and yet when the conversation consistently gets steered towards you know uh, he didn't mean it, uh, you know he doesn't hate anybody, don't accuse anybody of hating anybody, and when we're constantly having that discussion, then we don't have any time left for what we regard as the more important discussions. 
So, you know, if I criticize a board game or whatever it is, uh, you know, does it really have to, you know, go to, well, he didn't mean it. I, why can't I have a conversation? Wow, the center of hobby is really white. And a really white hobby is going to reproduce stereotypes that aren't that great. Can I have a, a conversation about that without triggering, you know, uh, accusations of intent and he didn't do it on purpose? You see how, you know, interpreting it in that narrow way is almost like a theft in and of itself stealing the word racism from us you know we go back into the long history you know wb du bois in the uh you know turn of the century frederick Douglass. you know going back and back and back all understood racism in this multi-layered context so as racism continuously gets interpreted in this feelings type way it's like a, a robbery and we could come up with another word but what who's to say that word won't get taken as a lot of things have been taken from us. So that's really uncomfortable to think about, but I'm not going to talk about it in a you're bad way. Point it out, see what's happening, invite folks to assess whether what I'm talking about is true or what, what parts of it are true, and you know figure out if there's a way to kind of connect a little bit better now that hopefully you understand a little bit more of my perspective and what I regard as a presentation of the issues of marginalized folks uh, writ larger. So uh, I, <laughs> there's another level, there's a deeper level to go, and I'm going to save that for uh, episode 2B, uh, which is coming up real soon. You can change your mind, you can change the world. So until next time, later everybody.